Ah, hello everybody. Um, oh, the Instagram isn't going live because of a poor connection, apparently. We're gonna see, I'm gonna see if I can sort that out. Oh. Bear with me, people. I'm just, I uh, can't work out why when I've got full signal, the Instagram live part of the feed is going a bit mental. So while you join me, I'm going to just see if I can work out why that is. Oh, it won't even let me end. Right, let's start again on Instagram. So this is a multi-technology approach, right? I'm trying to go with you on Facebook at the same time as going on Instagram. And I'm going to try another live now on Instagram. Seems to be working now and not. We're going to carry on anyway. Not a lot I can do about that, you see. It should be in together. Excellent. So that's technical support at the back there. Welcome, everybody. And I'm really sorry Instagram doesn't seem to be working. It's telling me there's a really poor signal. Um, so um, although we've tested this, I don't understand why it's not working. I might actually take it off internet and see if 4G works. No, 4G doesn't work either. Okay, so I'm going to carry on. Um, so welcome everybody, I'm Laura Willoughby, I'm the co-founder of Club Soda. So there's a few things that you need to know about this webinar. I'm going to be sharing um, my story with you. And so you can ask questions about that. I will see your questions as they come up and I'm going to answer them. So please do ask as many questions as you possibly can. If you're on Instagram and can't quite see this right now, I'm really sorry. Um, it seems to be not liking the connection. It must be something about East London or um, about how busy Instagram is with lives right now. So um, I apologize and I'm hoping it will pick up soon. This will also be a video that's available after the event and we'll also put it online and you can watch it tomorrow. So who am I? So I'm Laura, I'm the co-founder of Club Soda. There's two other co-founders as well, which are Yussi Tolvi and Drew Yeager. I'll tell you a little bit more about them later on. Um, but first of all, what's my story? So I've got to eight years alcohol free. I can't tell you how weird that is. I never thought I would be eight years alcohol free ever. And in fact, even when I started my journey to change my drinking, I never thought eight years was where it was going to be. I just knew I had to do something now. Now, um, for many of you, you would have been probably like me, which is that you have tried several attempts to change your drinking or try to moderate your drinking or doing all sorts of other things. And, um, and you're not sure where your, where, where your journey is or where you're going with it. Um, so hopefully my story will be able to give you a bit of that. And I've got this flashing screen from Instagram in front of me, so I'm really sorry. Um, so where do we start? I actually realize I don't tell my story that often. I like to tell other people's stories. I like to um, share the good news from everybody else. But what is it about my journey that meant I also created Club Soda? Well, how do I characterize my drinking? I was always a big drinker. I'm the Ladette generation, started drinking at 14, felt that equality was all about having the same quantity of booze as the blokes in the pub and drinking them under the table. For me, that's what um, I, it was all about. Now, my dad was a big drinker. And in fact, I'm gonna even try and do this live again. Hang on a second. Let's see if this will work again. We'll see if we can get it to work. So my dad was a big drinker. He um, he actually died at the age of 56 from drinking too much. And um, I always knew I was my father's daughter, right? I inherited two things from him, his ability to drink and his ability to, and his boobs, basically. Um, uh, I am my father's daughter. And I... I very much um, followed in his footsteps. So drinking really early. I used to drink in the pub with him when I was really young. I used to, um, 
uh, pride myself in the ability to drink as much cider as the blokes. So I was never one of those people who, who skimped when I was on an evening out. I always felt I had to stay to the end, probably to my detriment, as we know. But that meant that when I got into a position of a bit of crisis, my drinking went up. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. I'm going to just try and stop this um, Instagram because it is now not working at all. I don't know why it won't do that. Um, sorry, hang on a moment. You see, do you, I, I, don't, I can't get it to stop working. It won't even stop working. I can't. <laughs> it won't even stop people i've tried to do the most technical thing and it just it doesn't like the connection in east london so let me uh try and settle down so i got elected at 23 onto islington council i got elected really young and anyone who's been involved in politics will know a lot of politics is about um staying for drinks after campaigning setting into the pub into the early hours talking about how you're going to do stuff. You work really hard in politics. Don't ever underestimate people of any political party that get into politics. There's a lot of um, hard work, late nights, lots of volunteering, delivering leaflets, the works. Um, it can be really hard, and it's something that I dedicated my heart and soul to. I've been a community campaigner since I was 14, so it's very natural to me to want to get elected um, and do something um, uh in a community that i lived in in london and so i worked really hard to make that happen uh so then my career became very early in my 20s my evenings were all taken up with committee meetings council meetings chairing all sorts of um stuff civic events and engagements as well as you know holding down a full-time job so i worked hard and i played hard and every evening it was about going into the pub afterwards and as anyone who's been to civic occasions will know, an awful lot of cheap white wine. So um, so that's sort of how um, my drinking was. And it, it was always tempered by the fact that I was always, you know, early evenings I'd be knocking on doors. Um, I'd have lots of casework to do. I would always have other things that occupied me. So it never got too out of control. I remember a point in my late 20s where I decided to switch from drinking cider to wine because I felt that I drank cider too quickly only to get to that point where I realized that I could drink wine just as quickly as cider. But I'm someone who's, um, I would guess my identity has totally been shaped by the career that I'm in. It's very important to me. I, you know, marriage and children aren't important to me. These aren't things that are, are, are the things that I was looking for in life. I also um, realized that, um, you know, um, whereas other people had hobbies, politics was my hobby as well as my day job. And so, you know, blurring the lines between what was um, daytime, evening, leisure time, you know, I worked every weekend. Uh, I probably still do. So um, it meant that I had a very, that my job was a big part of my identity. I then ended up in a job that I didn't enjoy at all, where no one cared if I turned up where um which sounds like ideal right but i can tell you and you must be feeling a bit of this right now as well not being noticed not being valued not being in a in a work community of, for which you feel you've got a part is very very difficult and i was able to then find my mates when you were available for boozy lunches and push my drinking to the limit and so i would be drinking maybe every other day and not just drinking a small amount I, it was a bit like i was punishing myself i was um, I was self-harming myself because I didn't like what I was doing. I didn't like what I was becoming. I didn't like the job I was in. I couldn't see a way out of it. And so I would often not need to turn up to work anyway. So I'd have a hangover in the morning. I would stay up quite late um, drinking alcohol in front of TV in my shared house and all of those sorts of things. Um, and just like a lot of people, there wasn't really a rock bottom. What there was is a series of, of events that made me realize my drinking was getting out of control, but I didn't really want to do anything about it. I think deep down in the back of my mind, I knew I'd have to, otherwise I was going to end up like my dad. But I'm not sure if any of you have felt this, but when you knew you had to change, um, it could take years to make that change happen. But you also end up drinking all of the alcohol as if somehow someone is going to take away all of that alcohol away from you. It was really quite scary. And so it became like a bit of an extreme sport. And um, and it, it, 
like most people, a lot of series of events that that made me um, one by one question how much I was drinking and that I knew I had to do something. So no rock bottom, but it was things like watching a theatre production I'd always wanted to see and doing it with a hangover. And I'm really like, this is like most middle class reason ever, right? But really feeling I hadn't engaged properly in something that I thought was just amazing and just beautiful. Um, uh, spending a weekend drunk because it was the rugby and I had actually started drinking early in the morning with my brother and and really realising it was really affecting me by the Monday and I was beginning to shake. Um, uh, and the fact that I felt that I was becoming very boring company. Another thing that really affected me was the fact that I always thought I was a people person, right? Um, I could take people's problems and I could go and do something with them. I'm a natural activator. You tell me something's wrong, I want to fix it. And slowly over time, that began to erode. I began to think maybe I wasn't a people person. And there was a really good reason for that. And that was because I was too tired to even look people in the eye and have a conversation that involved concentration for anything more than a few uh, few minutes because I was so just tired from drinking so much. And and I and and if if I wasn't already losing a sense of self, whoa, that really compounded it totally. Um, so that's really um, began to frighten me. And so I don't really know what changed it apart from I got a tax return. I looked at it and thought, I have to do something. I have to do something about my drinking. I'm going to have to take this on the head. I've got a little bit of money in my bank account. Let me do something. And so I booked on a course. I won't delve too much into that course till a bit later because it was um, something that made me set up Club Soda. But I, I, I set the course and it was a really brave thing to do because it was two weeks before my birthday. And many of you will know that when you're looking to find a date where you're going to change your drinking, you'll be looking at your calendar and going, well, I'll do it after that significant day. I'll do it after that wedding. I'll do it after Christmas. I'll do it after my birthday because I want to have that one last hurrah. I think I got to the point when I realized it was never going to be a good time. There was a date, it was two weeks away that I could do. It wasn't in London, so I'd have to travel. Um, I didn't want to do the ones in London because in case anybody knew me and would see me. And so it was this date or no date. And I had the money in my bank account now. So I um, so I uh, booked the date. And then I went to a party with friends. And I told my friends. And I guess what I'm about to tell you now is that by accident... I, I managed to pull together a series of really good behavior change techniques. And the first one was setting a date, a date when I was going to commit the whole day to thinking about my drinking and, and focus on it. So it was really, it wasn't just that I said, I'm going to stop on this date, but I had put something in place to make sure that I was focusing on it. The second was I made myself accountable. I told some friends at a party the look of relief on their face was, was amazing. And then I proceeded to get completely drunk. Um, not um, actually, as it turns out, um, that was quite fortuitous in some ways because I met somebody who I then had a relationship with, who I then gave up drinking with. So I accidentally, through a very pissed evening, um, found a buddy um, to do this with. Somebody who said, okay, I'll give up the same time as you because my drinking is just like your drinking and I want to do the same. So why don't we do this together? And as it was a relationship, I also managed to, a new relationship, I also managed to completely change my environment because new relationships are that. You spend time with somebody new. It's all very exciting. I spent time at their house. I spent time at my house. Suddenly I had a distraction in a new person that I also felt some responsibility for. And for me, as somebody who's a naturally nurturing, activating person, that was ideal. So you can begin to see that I had, whilst some things were planned, other things I hadn't quite planned, but were, the, were great things to have done at that point in time. And I'm very lucky for those people to have come into my life. So whilst they're an accident for me, what I want to say is for you, these can be things that you can purposely plan into your changing drinking habits. Um, so I set a day, I went to the theater with a friend, uh, what would have been last night, and we went to the pub afterwards and I had my last alcoholic drink. I was determined that I wasn't going to be hungover on this day that I had spent so much money on. Having some money, um, having some skin in the game really helps as well. And I went on the course and I came out so angry about how shit it was and what liars they were 
and how unethical they were, that I'm pretty sure that that anger motivated me to, to stay alcohol free um, out of spite. But it also that day planted the seeds for Club Soda, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. Now, when I gave up eight years ago, there were no alcohol free drinks out in the world. So I went bonkers with a soda stream and lots of interesting tonic bases from around the world and exploring drinks. I was really lucky that friends helped me do some of that. I also threw myself in immediately to going to the pub. I don't know what possessed me actually, but probably because I still had things in the diary. And so I did still go out and I um, took my own drinks generally and um, and made a joke, which is my way of dealing with most things about um, changing drink, uh, about the fact that I wasn't drinking. You know, um, I've, I've done enough for London now. It's everyone else's turn to drink London Dry is basically where I went. And I saw it as a bit of a challenge. I enjoyed the thrill of, of not being drunk. Now, there's a few really important things to say about my first few weeks changing drinking. Um, uh, the fact that I treated it as a novelty was really helpful the, uh, as a bit of a challenge and, and really threw myself into what would be perceived as dangerous places was great but also the impacts were quite noticeable quite quickly. Now, um, some of you will be wanting to take a month off drinking and think that, um, that the weight's gonna drop off immediately, gonna be automatically a size 10 and the world's gonna be perfect. Now, lots of things will happen, but they won't necessarily be as big and dramatic as losing weight. And to be honest, you know, I mainlined Red Bull and cake for the first um, you know, five months of changing drinking. For me, that wasn't the issue. Um, for me, just get, getting through every day and feeling this new feeling was the important thing. So um, I didn't think about diet. I didn't think about any of those things. But funnily enough, my face was one of the first places to show it. Now, um, some of you may be like me, which is that alcohol is an inflammatory. So I always had a very puffy face. Some of you may notice it just in your puffy eyes. But I had a puffy face. I also took great delight in looking at my um, the whites of my eyes and seeing that they were less yellow and more white. But my face actually started to reduce quite quickly now. Um, and I'm actually, um, I am lighter now than I, than I was when I first gave up. But actually, I didn't lose weight when I first gave up. But lots of people thought I had because that puffiness had gone in my face. So do you want to see a picture? I don't show this picture very often. You can put in um, uh, my, uh, in to Google Councillor Laura Willoughby and you will find lots of pictures still around of me. This is one that I found that I really hate. So I'm going to show it to you. This is me. Can you see it? You, can you see how puffy my face was? Now, a lot of that wasn't weight. A bit of it was because alcohol was very good at making you very fat and heavy. But boy, when I look at that photo, I don't even remember looking like that. I've got other photos. I don't look like that in those. But this one, this one, terrible. But that began to go really, really quickly. The other thing that I got very quickly was a mixture of energy and tiredness, which sounds very um, random. But I, I felt more energetic in the mornings when I woke up, obviously, wasn't hungover. I felt I could cram a lot more into the day. It was absolutely amazing. But I also um, got waves of tiredness. And so I would just call into bed with an audiobook and and listen to audiobooks. And actually, that's quite normal. These are side effects. You don't have to be somebody who's been a rolling in the gutter drunk to have side effects from changing drinking. Low mood is likely to happen because you're denying yourself something. It's the same if you're on a diet from food as well or trying to do exercise and all of those things. It's a, you know, your brain doesn't like you to change habits. Um, you can get very tired um, when you change your drinking. Your body is literally recovering. I drank water like my body was going, you know, you haven't really drunk very much fluids that are good for you for 25 years. How about we just pull in all that water? So I drank lots of water. But the, the, the release of energy I had, that, that clarity began to be really intoxicating. I also did a few other things, which is I um, tested my blood sugar levels. They were pre-diabetic before I changed my drinking. And within a month, totally normal. So taking a bit of blood every day felt like I was doing something very tangible and medical. Um, so it was great. And then... Um, a couple of other important things happened. Firstly, is the person I gave up drinking with fell off the wagon. It was absolutely hideous. 
So I absolutely attribute <laughs> totally the fact that I've not fallen off the wagon um, to the fact that they did. And I lived through that with them and it, I didn't want to go there. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful to, to her for that. And I know that her journey has been different and successful as well. But um, seeing that and seeing how upset and guilty and ashamed she felt the day after really, really played on me. And I wanted to be strong for her. So again, that altruistic streak is really helpful. And so buddying up is a really great thing to do. The other thing was, is that three months I was volunteering on the Olympics. Now I had been involved politically in the bid process. The Olympics was something I had desperately wanted. And I remember being in Trafalgar Square when it was announced um, and all of that stuff. I really wanted to be volunteering on the Olympics. And although I hadn't ever set it as the bigger goal, I now recognize that that was so important to me that it was a key part in keeping me motivated and keeping me on track. That bigger thing, that thing I wanted to achieve, that thing I wanted in my life more than anything else became, was actually a bigger motivator. And so, you know, when you speak to Club Soda, when you um, look at our courses, we try and take you through that journey of the life it is that you want, that you're aiming for, that that not drinking will allow you to achieve. Well, that was a very tangible for me. And I remember at three months turning up at that Olympic Park and it's like all my energy had come back at once. The sleeping, not an issue anymore. I didn't want to sleep loads. It's like I had this massive surge of energy and I turned up to that Olympic Park as if I was an athlete myself. And just amazed, I'd sit on the bus and go, 6 a.m., 6 a.m., I'm on the bus. The Olympic Park, I would never have made this time of day before. It was just glorious. The weather was glorious. The games were glorious. Um, I got to do some interesting things. But most of all, I got to be part of it. And I would, ne I can tell you now, I, I would have, if I had still been drinking, what would have happened is I turned up there, realized there were more volunteers that you could shake a stick at, and they didn't really need us all. And I would have buggered off home. And instead, I made the most of those games, both by helping, but also by um, managing to get loads of people into the Olympic Park um, who wanted to go in. So it was absolutely fantastic. So I had all of these things that were happening that, that were life achievements. Um, about nine months, I would say that my brain came back into gear. Um, it started to work again. It was critical. It was able to do things. And, and for me, that was really exciting. Um, I was able to engage with issues. It's really easy when you're hungover just to go, well, look, you know, climate change, I'll think about that tomorrow. Or, um, you know, problems with the litter at the back of our flats, you know, I'll deal with that tomorrow. Didn't need to wait till tomorrow. I had the energy to do it today and to engage with it properly. It was very exciting for me to suddenly feel I've got my brain back. And one of the other great delights was all of those lovely micro interactions you have with people every day. Oh, boy, do they sustain me. And boy, had I missed them. I hadn't realized, right, how much those those small interactions with people mean a lot to me and made me feel very soon and very quickly again, like I was the people person that I thought I was. And so small, small, little, little signs, they're not big, but they're all things that when you add them up together, you know, resting properly, sleeping, energy, being able to engage with issues, getting eye contact with people and having a little smile with them in the morning. Wow, they are all big things when you push them together. And, you know, all in all, they kept me motivated because I really, really enjoyed them. They really gave me energy. And as an extroverted person, I get energy from other people. And that realization really, you know, that came into to, to full view when I changed my drinking. So, oh, I've not been looking at your comments. That's terrible. Um, cool. I can see all of your comments. That's that's excellent. Yes, we, you know, we all think we're unique, special snowflakes, and our drinking's different to everyone else's drinking. Or we like to try and compare ourselves to other people's drinking to just to check to see that we're not drinking as much as anybody else, and we are unique. But you know, the truth is, is we're all very similar. Alcohol makes us even more similar. And how we change is also very similar. So as much as we think our circumstances are different, you know, it's all the same stuff that we need to do. We need to set a date. We need to plan. We need to put in effort. We need to make ourselves accountable to other people. We need to talk to others in a similar situation and, and hear their stories so we can take their learning into our learning 
um, and we need to make sure that we keep note of all of the things that are happening that are positive that aren't just about losing half a stone or um, becoming a marathon runner right these are all things that you you need to take note of and, and make part of your progress through whatever journey you're on so um but what else shall I tell you let me tell you a little bit more about their, where Club Soda came from. So I told you I went on this one-day course. I'm not going to name what the one-day course is, but um, they take a lot of money from you and they basically read a book at you for the day. As somebody who's been in the public sector for a long time, I um, realised that um, there were people in the room who were dependent drinkers, who were physically dependent on alcohol. And they were going to tell those people to go out of the room at the end of the day and stop drinking entirely, which is dangerous and secondly they were sending out some very vulnerable people probably myself included into the world without any ongoing support made me very very angry and in all the conversations I had with people afterwards people who asked me at parties how I gave up drinking and why and how they might go about it I realized that there was a really there, there's a gap for something in this country that felt like a diet club, like Weight Watchers or Slimming World, but that was angled towards alcohol instead, that said it doesn't matter what your journey is, whether it's to moderate or take a break or go alcohol free, there needs to be something to help people do a self-guided journey, which is ultimately what all of us in Club Soda are doing. We're taking a self-guided journey. We're doing it ourselves with um, additional resources that we're finding from, from you know, Club Soda community and Quitlet books and everything and taking all that learning and getting on with it ourselves. We don't need face-to-face -face interaction. But something that was ethical. So many of you would have seen mad claims from hypnotherapists or um, all sorts of systems that promise to cure you or really expensive rehabs that promise to lock you away from the world until they think you're ready. And of course, some of those things do work. Um, um, but not all of them are run by qualified professionals, I have to tell you. And um, the, the rehab market in Britain is also a really weird and difficult place to navigate. So finding the right ethical and qualified ones are really important. But there's all these people that claim to cure you and make you better and, and, take, and basically give you the answer without putting any work in. And they all charge you vast sums of money and they're completely unregulated and nobody um, and nobody looks into them. And that that really, really upset me because what I've realized is, is that the more work you put into changing your drinking, the more likely that you are to stick to your overall goal in the longer term. Because at the end of the day, you can be shut away in a rehab for four weeks or four months, but you still have to come out and socialize in the real world afterwards. You still need skills that will mean that you can take it into the long term. And you know it will take more than hypnotherapy to, to change your drinking, although hypnotherapy can support it. You still need to do other things. It won't be good enough on its own because we're talking about something that's really... Uh, a very strong and innate part of our culture, which we're taught to use from a very early age to deal with stress and anxiety and happiness and all those other things. And it's more than one approach. So um, so I kept thinking, why, why is there a Weight Watchers and Stemming World magazine, but there isn't one for change your drinking? Oh, that's because we're all too embarrassed. None of us would ever, right, go up to a till and hand over money for a magazine about changing drinking would right run a mile because we're British and we're embarrassed and there's stigma attached to it. So the idea for Club Soda came then to say, right, well, why don't we have um, the equivalent of a diet club for people changing their drinking? And I finally decided to take the plunge a couple of years after changing my drinking and gave up my job, sold everything I had sublet my room uh, that I was renting in a friend's house and threw everything into setting up Club Soda as just an idea. So it was a really early stage idea. We got a small business loan and all the money that I could muster to put into it, which wasn't very much because obviously I'd been drinking for 25 years. Why would there be any spare cash? Um, and so I decided to take the idea and I went on a small business program to help do that to look at how I'd make an idea a reality. 
could you imagine? I would, could never have done that when I was still drinking. I could never have taken such a big risk. I could never have just given up a job. I could never have gone, this is an idea of my own and I'm going to go and do it. But that's where Club Soda was born. And it's um, really um, important to me that Club Soda is set up with an, with an ethical view in mind. So we're a social impact business. Our aim isn't to make loads of money. Our aim is to be sustainable, which, you know, I'm really hoping we can be someday, but to make things affordable, to offer lots for free as well, which is free to you, but still costs us a lot to do, to make sure that if anyone shows any signs of being dependent drinkers, that we can signpost you ethically and we can give you confidence to go to face-to-face -face services in a way that I wasn't. Um, but to say, you know what, you can go to your local turning point or you can go to your local service. You will find people there who you will get on with and you will find some face-to-face -face support that will augment all the other stuff you're doing if that's what you need. And to be able to, when you need extra help from a counsellor who's experienced, that we can direct you to the right people. So that's where Club Soda came from and the community started um, really early on. And, um, and yeah, and actually we've been going five years now and we've been learning a lot along the way. So you will know that we've got the free Facebook group and the free blog and podcast and um, regular stuff that we do and social events in the real world as well as currently online. Um, we've got our programs, but we also now have got a whole piece of work which was totally guided by all of you, which was about um, changing uh, the way pubs and bars act. Hang on a moment, you see want something. What about, sorry. I will do. Honestly, does anybody else want someone to backseat webinar for them? UC is terrible, right? I haven't put a banner up yet that I've done because I haven't quite finished telling you stuff. But, you know, anyway. <laughs> UC is also co-founder of Club Soda. I should tell you that story as well. Who wants to hear the story of how I found my co-founders on my first date? I'm going to tell you about that in a bit. Right. So we also work with pubs and bars and restaurants to get them to change their range of low and no alcohol drinks. That came out of a piece of research that um, members asked us to do in 2015 about how to improve um, uh, why there wasn't any good drinks in pubs and bars, which in 2015, there really wasn't. So, um, so you know, that spawned all sorts of things. And the Mindful Drinking Festival came out of that as well, because as the new low and no alcohol free drink started to hit the market, um, suddenly um, we were in the best place to put on an event to showcase them all to you. So this is the banner you see wanted me to put up. You can see everything that we do on joinclubsoda.com. So actually, if you're not signed up to our email, do do that, because you will get our weekly motivational email. You will get discounts for things you will get to know about the festival and all those sorts of things. And so if you're one of those people who isn't there already, then do. Um, so, so, you know, Club Soda has got a very solid, um, we're a social impact business. We use behavior change science behind what we do. Even if you go to the bottom of our website page, you will begin to see the fact that we've got a whole research section where we've been part of research projects around self-efficacy, which we've partnered in, but we also do our own research and all of our courses have also been um, evaluated and verified and we're doing some more with our new courses now. So for me, it was always very important to be able to hand you not just a way of changing your drinking, but also the behavior change science behind it. And you may also notice that I'm not the coach. I'm not a coach. We don't promise to coach you. We won't do face-to-face -face coaching. And we don't do that because I'm not qualified to. And to be honest, I'm not skilled enough to do it. Coaches need to like listen. I do a lot of talking. I'm a movement builder. So we've built a movement and you're part of this movement. So, um, and I believe movements can help change habits. And so we've stuck well within the things that we know what to do and how to do it. And so use as an economist, Drew's a coach, I'm a movement builder, and together we've built something that we feel is um, both groundbreaking, but also um, delivers social impact. I'm really proud of what we've done, actually. We, 
Um, I never um, in the whole of my life thought that we would be in a position where we would be some of the most influential people in the drinks industry right now, just because we know so much about low and no alcohol. Could you believe it? I can't. <laughs> That's quite funny, really. She says drinking out of a Carlsberg glass. Still take the freebies, right? Mm. So where does this take me? Um, I also never thought that we'd be in a position where we um, would be able to produce a book. This book is really important. If you want to know about what makes Club Soda tick, then this book is a really good example because it's not written by me. It was written by you guys. Look, the Club Soda community. Again, really important to me that this wasn't a book with one author's name on the front, but that it was done through um, a collaborative effort. And so we did lots of surveys and um, consultation with all of you in the Club Soda community to get the best advice from you in order to write this book. Then Drew did all the words and I advise on pictures, right? All right, a bit more than that. But, you know, Drew did a lot of the writing. Anya brought her expertise around drinks. We've got some amazing cases of Club Soda members and it's absolutely packed full of advice from all of you. Again, Club Soda isn't about one individual. It's not about me at the top of it. It's about that collective effort that we believe that can make a change. And again, that's a really important part of what makes Club Soda tick. We sometimes get it wrong. We sometimes don't ask you enough. We sometimes panic because we're about to run out of money. But most of all, um, we're doing this because we believe this is the best way to help people change their drinking and that we wanted to do it ethically and with evaluation and with science at the back end. So yeah, some of you have been with Club Soda for like the whole five years. People like Joe, who's one of the volunteer admins. Joe's been here since the beginning. It's amazing. And and she must be close to nearly five years alcohol free, right? If not already. So, you know, in Club Soda, people have stuck around for the long term and have shared their expertise and see helping back as a really big part of keeping to their goal. So that's really important too. We want to be there for you wherever you are in your journey even if you're maintaining a long-term goal. So I've written some things down, which um, as some of you will know, is quite important because there's two things I thought would improve with changing my drinking, my memory and sleeping with inappropriate people. And neither of those things happened. Um, it's always very upsetting when you discover, and which is something that I need to warn you of, that the things that you thought were, were a result of drinking in your personality they may actually have been you all along. Sucks. I've got memory like a sieve. But anyway, I'm going to just check on any more comments. Cool. So, right. Um, feel free to ask questions, guys. You know, it's very nice that you say congratulations to me, but that will only overinflate my ego. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I'm just double checking. Oh, gosh, a whole stream of ladettes. We are of a generation, aren't we? So let me go through 10 things that I've learned from changing my drinking. First of all, um, I've already mentioned this, but changing the things that change may not be what you expect because we expect all sorts of things. We hope everything will right itself very suddenly. But I describe changing your drinking like 100 little epiphanies, right? It would be small things like um, remembering the second half of a play, who knew it wasn't my job to, to keep the whole of London's theatre district going by drinking before, during and after the production? I could just enjoy the play and go home and remember it and think about it. I remember the first time that happened. It was absolutely amazing. I also remember the first time that um, I got upset by something and didn't just automatically act on it. Now, I automatically act on lots of things. You just have to ask EC. Um, but... Um, I uh, I remember sitting and thinking, oh, I'm feeling a really strong emotion. I haven't immediately stormed off, shouted, screamed, cried, whatever the right emotion would have been. I haven't done that immediately. This is amazing. I'm just feeling the emotion. So I describe it like 100 little epiphanies, but it's probably more like a, a million because I'm still having them now. I still learn things about myself every single day. So do try and hold on to those. It might be that you've learned that food tastes nicer or that you can smell differently or that your the whites in the eyes are whiter or all sorts of small things. You didn't lose your temper with somebody when you normally used to because you're a lot calmer because you're not as tired. Um, it might be something you've done at work, which you're really proud of that you managed to do with a 
total dedication because you're not thinking about having a drink at six o'clock. Whatever it is, note it down, keep an idea about it because these all add up and they all add up to a picture of what your life is like without drinking. So a hundred little epiphanies, keep them going. Okay, Ooh. I'm going to bring UC in to ask that one, Rob. Um, and I'm going to come back to you in a moment, Anne. The second thing is, is I have now learned to trust my gut feeling and actually taking the plunge to set up Club Soda was um, one really good example of that. But actually, I realized how much I had learned not to trust myself anymore because I was a drinker in the same way as I wouldn't trust somebody else as a drinker. Oh, you know, you shouldn't trust them to run that meeting because it's at 10 in the morning and they're never good at 10 in the morning. You know, that idea you have of people who you know, are not totally reliable. Well, I had that of myself and therefore I never trusted my gut instinct. But suddenly my gut instinct got a lot better. I was able to make more rational decisions and think through things with a clear head and with some energy and make better decisions. So I've learned to trust my gut, which is a, a really big thing when you've been through a long period of feeling guilt and shame about your drinking to learn to go, I've made a decision and I believe this is the right decision and I'm going to take it now. It's absolutely mind boggling. Um, third is dating. Um, so I, I often find it difficult when people ask us about dating because um, uh, I don't come from a very traditional view on dating in the first place. So I don't wanna marry, I don't want kids. I am willing to explore different relationship types. But what I can tell you is this. Even when you're dating, you are basically looking to build the life that you want to lead and find a relationship that is compatible for you. Somebody who shares your values and shares the destination you want to go to. So the destination for me was about finding people who wanted to interact with me as an individual in a relationship, but accept that I was an individual as well. And people for whom monogamy may not be the only um, relationship choice and who had no desire to get married and have children. Now, that's very different for many of you, and I fully appreciate that. But the thing that is the same is that I, I went into dating looking for people who wanted the same type of relationship with me, not people who would accept me for being a non-drinker. And that's really important. So the conversations I had with people um, before I even went on a date with them were about what their relationship expectations were. And so when I got on the date with them, the fact that I didn't drink was neither here nor there, because the thing that we were focused on was, you know, the similarities in the way we thought about relationships and talking about, you know, relationships in a modern society and finding out about each other as individuals, because I wanted to go out with an individual, not somebody who wanted to be seen as part of a couple. Does that make some sense to you? I hope it does, because I often feel like a bit of a fraud when I talk about relationships, but I'm very passionate that... Anyone who doesn't accept you for the fact that you don't drink is a dickhead and you don't need to go on a date with them because they're not right for you on, in so many levels. Um, and that's just an early warning system, right? So you do not have to go on a date with them. You need to find people who accept you as an individual for the decisions that you've made for you and they have no right to tell you how to live your life. And you need to have that confidence for yourself. It doesn't matter that you don't have 10 dates in the year and that you can't find somebody within that date. It's about the one date that's the right one. And the right one is somebody on a date who doesn't care that you don't drink, okay? Um, if it helps, you see Andrew, her co-founders of Club Soda, were two of my first sober dates. And Hannah, who's also on the front of many of our um, Club Soda um, websites and stuff, was one of my first sober dates too. They all drink um, to some degree, um, but th the fact that I didn't had no bearing on that at all. And they were very considerate people to go out and um, date with because they 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 kept up with my pace of drinking, which was not really any. So um, all good, right? OK, um, fourth, your social life will change. Lots of people worry about changing their drinking because it will change their social life. But let me tell you this. You, won't, you don't have the same social life that you did when you were 20. And you will not have the same social life when you were 60, even if you carry on drinking, right? So your social life has changed over time. We still have this um, rosy tint of view that we're still going out clubbing every weekend um, all the time when really we've been sat at home drinking in our pants. 
right? So um, so your social life will change, but it doesn't mean it will get worse. My social life has got better because I can do so much more with my time. I can sometimes go to three different events in an evening and still get home to go to bed at 10, right? And I can have really good time at each of those things because I'm fully present in every single one of them. An hour and a half with a friend after work is far more valuable than the six hours I spent in the pub after work getting drunk. Whoever set the rule that an evening out meant getting caned over the whole course of an evening? Evenings out are about meeting friends and doing something interesting. And that may only take an hour, or it may be three hours if you go out and, and have a meal or something else. But it's about the quality of the time. And then weekends, that's so long now in comparison to when I was drinking. Why would I ever want to give up that gorgeous amount of time for hangover? Never anymore. Um, cool. Then, um, the other thing to know is, is um, you will have to rebuild your, or even build from scratch, your emotional intelligence. Because we're in a country where we're taught to deal with every emotion through alcohol from a very young age, if you've started drinking when you were 14, like I did, then every single emotion has been dealt with through alcohol. Being happy, being sad, being lonely, being all sorts of things, but I've only ever dealt with them by drinking. I now have to deal with them without drinking. I call it life in high definition. I've had to learn some new skills, but that's okay because they've made me better and more resilient in the longer term. I've had to learn a lot of emotional intelligence. But it's far better to feel those feelings and just keep pushing them away with alcohol. And one of the things that I've learned is it's not if people who have never drunk, people who don't drink, they're not happy all the time. Happy all the time isn't normal. Most of the time, we're just OK. And it's OK to be just OK. Otherwise, how will you know when you're really happy and how will you know when you're really sad? So. When I'm having a down day, I'm having a down day. But now I can deal with it because I don't have three down days afterwards because I've got a hangover from drinking because I had a down day. I'm able to bounce back a lot quicker and get on with my life. Um, oh, it's my Uncle Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, okay. Um, I The other thing that I've learned is I've learned the difference between alone and loneliness. This comes up an awful lot. Um, in club soda people drink because they're lonely and because I'm an extrovert and always think I'm a people person I often thought that I drank because I was lonely because anytime I was alone I called lonely <laughs> what a twat I really was quite a twat no apparently it's okay to spend time on your own and to do things that are good for you and nurturing for you on your own and when I'm on my own I'm not lonely I'm just on my own but now I have to um to be in my own company, which I probably didn't very much like before because, you know, nobody else did. So why would I? And instead now I do things with my alone time that are nurturing. So I listen to a book, I do cooking. All right. Those of you who know how, how many hours I work will know that some of that is a little bit of a lie because I actually fill a lot of time with working um, when I'm alone. But I now value that alone time. I restore, I regenerate, I gain energy from being alone that I can then bring into my life and my social life with other people. I am not lonely, um, but I do like now like to spend time alone. Um, that doesn't mean some people aren't lonely and that's not a reason um, to not drink. And I'd like to talk uh, another day about that, but, um, but do try and see if you can distinguish between alone and loneliness, because it was one of the most groundbreaking things that I ever did. Um, number six, uh, oh no, it's number seven, I think. Oh, did I ever say no good with numbers, right? Um, I am now living my values. I now feel like I'm the person I was when I moved to London when I was 21 and all political and wide-eyed and bushy-tailed and wanting to change the world. You can live the life you want and with your values intact if you uh, are not drinking. It's far easier to do that. I've got a blog about it on um, joinclubsoda.com. Oh, I can put up the banner that UC was telling me about. Here we are. Um, so you can see all of the blogs on there. If you just type in the word values, you will find a blog that I've done about it. But for me, that was really important that I'm now living the kind of life um, that that I was, um, that I wanted. Um, and it does keep on giving. So 
we're, we're always in a rush, aren't we? We always think that, right, I'm going to give up drinking, I'm going to lose loads of weight, I'm going to do another degree, I'm going to do this and that and the other, and then it'll all be perfect. And then within six months, it hasn't happened, and we feel we're a complete failure, which, of course, is bollocks. Um, and the things that I've done this year, I would never have been able to do if I hadn't have given up drinking. So I've taken up running, but I've only taken it up in the last year or so. I didn't take it up immediately after giving up drinking. I was very resistant to it. But I couldn't have taken it up if I was still drinking. I couldn't have done half the things I've done this year if I was still drinking. I couldn't have set up my fun swim club and all those other things if I was still drinking. So what I need you to know is, is it will keep on giving because nothing that you do, loads of the things that you do after changing your drinking, either getting it under control or going alcohol free, those that you'll do tons of things that you would never have done if alcohol was still playing such a big part in your life. Um, eight or nine or whatever number it is. Um, I have lost nothing. I alcohol has had its time for me, but it was giving me nothing anymore. It wasn't adding to any of my social occasions. It wasn't adding to my life in any way. It wasn't oiling any social wheels. In fact, it was probably making it worse. So I've been there and I've done that. Alcohol had nothing left to offer me. Now um, I have gained lots. So I've lost nothing and I've gained everything. So when you're trying to look at the decision that you want to make about drinking, have a have a think about really are are some of the things that you're losing that that call that valuable to you what is it that you could gain instead because for me this is why um, I don't subscribe to the disease based model around alcohol which says you've got disease every day and you just have to get through every day it's not like that at all I don't want to drink anymore because I don't want to lose what I've gained what I have is far more important than anything alcohol can offer me because I know what alcohol can offer me and I've tried it all that's fine. It's gone. It's done. Gains. It's all gains. Um, and, and the final thing I want to say to you all is that it is possible. Um, it is possible to change your drinking, but it does take effort. You do have to put in the work. There will be days when it goes wrong. There'll be days when you drink more than you intended to, or you, you drink when you're on an alcohol-free um, time. But the sooner you pick yourself up, the more you will learn, the more you'll take that into your next experience. And you shouldn't ever, ever take away the days that you've done successfully. You know, you may be counting days and that's fine. But, you know, if you've managed two weeks, which is two weeks longer than you've managed ever before, then that's a win. And then you can learn from the experience and move on every time you learn. And it does take hard work, but persistence and hard work will mean that you will get to where you want to be. And um, and we're here for you. You know, you don't get thrown out if suddenly you've started drinking again of club soda. We're here for you all the way because this isn't a linear process. You will learn along the way. There are many things um, that um, will help you succeed. Um, I'm going to answer some questions that are from members of my family that I've noticed. Oh, this is the problem of doing it on a on a Facebook page as well. Um, uh, so somebody asked, is um, is moderation possible? Um, I want to tell you um, that yes, it is possible. And I know people who have made it possible and they've worked really hard at it. But a lot of it does depend on how long your drinking career has been and how much you're drinking at this point in time. Um, even if, um, regardless, I do believe that taking a three month break, um, but if you can't manage three months, a month break is a really good way to start. Most people want to moderate their drinking because they don't believe that they can do some social events, their Friday or Saturday night without drinking. And But until you do those nights without drinking, how are you going to know that it's possible to do them and then how to moderate to achieve them, right? Um, don't forget that whilst um, alcohol has rewired your brain, so the longer you've been drinking, the, hard, the harder you are rewired. And that's a lot of unpicking to do. And so you may find that moderation is quite difficult, but you'll only know if you try. So try something, set yourself some moderation rules and try and see what happens and see how you go. And if that doesn't work, maybe take a month off and see how that goes and then review at the end of that. Um, everybody's different. You know, I speak to lots of people in their 20s who find moderation a lot easier because their drinking was 
mainly weekends and they've only been drinking for like 10 years not 25 years right so um so don't forget alcohol has such a cumulative effect on your body people who tell me that they don't have hangovers partly i think they just got used to feeling that shit all of the time but also it doesn't matter whether you feel the hangover or not the damage inside is still the same right so that that change in your brain and that constant rewiring is is um really um really important and only you'll know how how deep that is until you begin to try something but try something start setting yourself some moderation rules start thinking about what you want your relationship for out al with alcohol to be um we'll be sharing actually some more stuff around this but also we've got our courses on um club soda so if you go to um joinclubsoda.com you will find our courses on there and we take you through a whole journey which doesn't say you have to give up or moderate it takes you on a journey to decide which of those options might be right for you now how did you see give up drinking you see uh well no uh you're right you didn't give up drinking you a moderate drinker but this is a quite interesting thing to talk about which is that Yusuf's journey to moderation didn't come because he sat up one day and went that's it i'm going to moderate and here's some rules it was for he on the day that he decided something had to change was the day that he decided something bigger had to change in his life and he wanted to put some time into a meditation practice and to think about living his life in a different way and changing his drinking was part of that and then he took quite a long break which i believe was was it 18 months you see yeah. it was 18 months before he then decided to try and moderate and after that point he had achieved some of the things he wanted for his life around um, a regular meditation practice in his Tai Chi and um, not working so hard, which I've now managed to completely ruin by bringing him into Club Soda. Um, let me just see if there's any other questions. Uh, oh yeah, Peter talk, uh, talks about the fact that it um, that he forgot what it felt like to be normal. Oh my, yes, because you never give yourself enough time to recover. I used to pride myself in the fact that I didn't drink every day, but of course I was never really cut, recovered from the days that I did drink um, when I was in that terrible job. And so I, I forgot what normal felt like, which is probably why just after giving up drinking, it was just like this amazing, like, oh my God, things feel so different. It's amazing. Um, cool. And and well done to all of you people um, who um, do gratitude journals. I'm still resisting that one, the writing down of a gratitude journal, but I do know it helps so many people. And if you listen to our podcast, um, you will see more about that. So where does this leave us? So eight years since giving up drinking, five years since setting up Club Soda, and now we're in the middle of COVID-19. We did a free sober weekend last weekend. We continue to, to work hard on the podcast and the blogs and the things that will motivate you to keep you going. Um, uh, I want Club Soda to, to survive um, COVID. So um, we ask everyone who joins the Facebook group and signs up to our email list if they will uh, contribute on a pay what you want basis, which is how we've operated for a long time. People still obviously do our courses, which are reasonably priced at £40 um, for a really intensive peer reviewed and science backed course. But um, we actually train and support um, a whole network of around 40 admins who keep the community safe. We do free, we manage and support volunteers um, in local areas to run social events when they're allowed again. We um, spend a lot of time every week writing blogs and doing podcasts. And we'd like to carry on doing all of that free stuff, particularly now. So if you haven't contributed to Club Soda, um, then please do. If everyone just bought me a drink to say congratulations, Laura, for getting to eight years, then um, that would be great because that would really help us over the next few months. We can carry on putting in a really useful content. Over 500 people responded to our survey a few weeks ago, which you can currently see on our website where we um, asked you what you needed. And so that's now shaping the stuff that we're putting together over the next few months and um and we will continue to do that through this time of covid and beyond so we've always had a big free offer in club soda and that's never going away and you see can send you a link uh, to the support page if you're up for that small donations do make a really big difference and we don't ask them all the time and yes when we're allowed social events again we will do them 
if you want to run one in your local area, then you can email me at laura at joinclubsoda.co.uk and we will, um, you know, our volunteers uh, run ones local to them, you know, maybe once, twice, three times a year. So do do that. Um, uh, and you've asked why it wasn't good to stop drinking just like that. It's really important. Of all the drugs in this world, alcohol is the most dangerous one to stop from suddenly if you are dependent. Now, we don't ever use the word alcoholic in club soda for a couple of reasons. One is it's an identity and not a medical condition. And it also muddies the water between, you know, it suggests that there's a normal way of drinking and then there's an alcoholic and there's a very fine line. The line that is really important is that you can become dependent on alcohol. If you drink a lot, you, you can still hold down a perfectly good job and still become dependent on alcohol. And if you, you are physically dependent on alcohol, and you suddenly stop, you can have seizures and you can die. It's as simple as that, which is why whenever you um, maybe have um, come across your local drug and alcohol services, they do a survey with you to see what your drinking habits are so they can assess whether they think you're a dependent drinker. So nobody should tell you to stop immediately if they're worried in any way about the amount you drink and that you may be physically dependent. You can taper, so reduce how much you're drinking until you get to a point when that's a very low level and then it's safe to stop. But if you are dependent, it's dangerous. And so all of those services that suggest that you should stop immediately and don't give you any assessment or any warning, you know, there are warnings all over Club Soda, there are warnings all over our book about that, then don't stop immediately because it's really important to me that you do it safely and that we signpost you ethically. So if you ever want us to signpost you to your local services or make an introduction for you, then please let us know. That is why it's so dangerous. It's even safer, it's even more dangerous than heroin to detox from yet. Yeah, you know, um, in our hierarchy of drugs, heroin probably at the top. So, so that's the reason why. Um, there's so much I'd like to share with you. Um, we actually do have a back catalogue of webinars on our YouTube channel, which you can have a look at as well. Um, we'll be doing some more stuff over the next few weeks to help you deal with lockdown. And we continue to take your ideas and share them with everyone else to help them as well. So do keep sharing with us. Do feel free to email me. Every time you reply to the Monday email, you get through to me. I uh, That's really important to us as well. There's no no reply emails in Club Soda. And um, so I'm going to stop talking because I've done an hour and I know I can just carry on. Um, ask me any questions afterwards. And thank you very much. Sorry, it didn't work on Instagram. If anyone was watching on Instagram, it seemed to be not the day for it.